Welcome back. Today we're going to look at the High and the Gothic Middle Ages. This would be chapter 6 in our textbook titled Christendom, Europe in the Age of Faith from 1000 to 1300. So in this chapter, there are four major things that are going on. Uh, the age is ushered in by the Crusades, and this time period also witnesses Europe's rise of their urban centers and cities are founding, uh, the founding of universities, and the construction of massive cathedrals the Romanesque style in the early stages, and then the High Gothic style. The Roman Catholic Church is dominating the culture of Europe. The authority and eminence of the church is rivaling that of royal monarchs in Europe's young nation states. And its patronage is responsible for some of the greatest landmarks of the era. So the type of art that we see is inspired by the Christian way of sin to salvation, inspired uh, uh, medieval morality plays, writings by mystics, preachers, music and praise and redemption. And in the 13th century, an urban center enjoyed the pa patronage of a rising middle class. We see great sculptures, stained glass in the cathedrals, devotional altarpieces in the Gothic style, and polyphonic music. And I teased out the polyphonic music as we were comparing it to plain chant in our last chapter. So the medieval church. The church is the bedrock of European culture. It is also a political institution against the rising tide of European monarchies. The pope, the papacy, the highest authority of the Catholic Church is taking measures to ensure its independence and dominance. In 1022, the Church rid itself of secular influence by founding the College of Cardinals as the body solely responsible for electing the Pope. Medieval pontiffs function much like secular monarchs, governing huge, complex bureaucracy that incorporate financial, judicial, and disciplinary branches. The Curia, the papal court, and the highest church court had a vast network of ecclesiastic courts, and Christians had been donating um, and bequeathing to Christendom many acres of land that by the end of the 12th century makes the Catholic Church the largest single land owner in the uh, Western Europe. Among the Christians of every rank of church, they, um, among lay Christians of every rank, the church commanded religious obedience and reinforced this obedience with penalties such as excommunication, exclusion from the holy sacraments, and the interdict, the excommunication of a tire, an entire city or state used to dissuade secular rulers from opposing papal policy, and also the spiritual weapon heresy. The, um, in spite of the, the spiritual weapon heresy, the denial of the revealed truths of the Christian faith, and this is going to spread, this heresy is going to spread fast in European groups. We have new orders of monks that are going to be founded in this time period, the Franciscans by Francis of Azizi, and also the Dominicans by Dominique Guzman. And they are both going to have various forms of looking at the church in a way to respond to inequities in the church, to respond to the uh, acquisition of wealth, and also, when it comes to St. Francis, doing things like outreach and uh, trying to convert in, uh, in far-off lands 
and also building things like hospitals and schools and orphanages. Now the Waldensians, the Waldensians were the followers of 13th century French reformer Peter Waldo. He denounced the growing worldliness of the church and proposed that the lay Christians administer the sacraments that the Bible, the sole source of religious authority, um, and that they did not need the intermediary of the priest or the Catholic Church, and that the Bible should be translated into local vernacular rather than Latin to make it more accessible. The Church condemned these views, uh, finding them, uh, um, they launch a um, an anti-heretical crusade uh, against those that were standing against the church, almost as violent as the crusades themselves. To further this, in 1233, the Pope established the Inquisition, a special court designed to stamp out heresy and denouncing people as heretics. The church considered in its inquisition that was usually done in secret with physical torture to obtain a confession. The church considered in injury to the body preferable to the eternal damnation of the soul. And notice how that does kind of relate to what we learned from St. Augustine in chapter 4, that the soul is pure and the body is impure. the church and the state. So in the church as a state, we are finding that um, pontiffs such as Gregory VII from 1073 to 1085, Pope Innocent III from 1198 to 1216 are claiming ultimate authority as the caretaker of the soul, and the monarchs of rising nation stations are coming into conflict with these churches. And eventually, they are going to have to come to head, and there may have to be some sort of separation that ultimately happens. But these popes are saying that the church is supreme in all matters. So in terms of the church, the church is giving sacraments, the acts of sacred acts that impart grace and free uh, the free and unearned favor of God. The seven sacraments um, are fixed in 2015 and affect every phase of human life. Baptism purifies the recipient from the original sin. Confirmation admitted the baptized to full church privileges. Ordination invested those entering the clergy with priestly authority. Matrimony blessed the union of man and woman. Penance, penance announced the repentance of sins and offered absolution. You're also telling the church what your sins are. The Eucharist is the central and most important of the sacraments that joins human beings to God by uh, eating the body and drinking the blood of Jesus. And then finally, the last sacrament prior to death, extreme unction that provides final and absolution from sins. And then in doing this, the sacraments are participating in almost every major event in a person's life. So they are basically a, a mother church, you could say, the, the mother church as shepherds guiding members of their flock from cradle to grave. And their conduct is going to determine whether their souls go to heaven or hell or purgatory, the place of purification from sins after one dies. The council defined purgatory as an intermediate realm, occupied the soul after death and before the last judgment. Women in the Middle Ages. So in the Middle Ages, um, Women are holding positions of wife, mother, peasant, artisan, and nun uh, if they choose to join the church, as well as some leadership roles such as abbess or queen regent. So they could be a queen, they could be an abbess, they cannot be a pope, they cannot be a priest. But there is some places for women in women's spaces in the abbess 
to become a, uh, in the nunnery, to become um, part of a hierarchy that is all women. So women are joining the church to escape marriage and child rearing, to be literate, and to play a more active religious role. In the, this role of nun in the nunneries, we are finding some visionary literature being written. With visionary, visionary literature, they are recording one's intuitive and direct knowledge of God. Perhaps the greatest of the writers in this era, from 1098 to 1175, is the mystic Hildegard of Bingen. She is a Benedictine nun. She goes to the convent at age eight. She is a scholar of both Latin and her native German. She wrote treatises on natural science and medicine, the treatment of disease, her writings on the nature of the universe, meaning of scripture, and the destiny of Christian soul are, are some of the best expressions of the entire age of faith. She writes 77 songs offering praise for the Virgin Mary, and her song, The Ordo Virtutum, is the play of virtues, became the very first music drama. At age 42, she began experiencing intense visions that inspired her to write a number of visionary tracks. The Skivas, Know the Ways of the Lord, recount her visions of angels and of uh, the, um, the divine space that they are praying to. And she remains one of the most uh, important individuals of this era and I think maybe one of the most interesting women that we have studied so far in a class where women so far have been very rare in terms of uh, knowing their name like Sapphos from the Greeks and her poetry. St. Francis is a medieval humanist. He is born wealthy and creates his own offshoot monastery that the Catholic Church will ultimately absorb. He believes in uh, poverty, in chastity, and in humility. He is um, born into wealth, but rejects his wealth and his father's values. He goes about uh, begging for food and lodging as he travels through the Christian world. He evangelizes in citizens. He gets followers. He is uh, believing in simplicity and humility, wearing a rope as a belt, and ultimately sermonizing to animals. He has a mystical relationship to animals and will be regarded as a mystic, that after his death, he will be credited with numerous miracles. And the Franciscan sect of monks, again, the monks that say in the United States, uh, the Franciscans start Catholic churches, orphanages, hospitals, charity is what it's all about. There is a basilica made in his honor, and in this basilica, we see that it is, rather than made in mosaics and expensive stones, is fully painted. And the idea of painting the church rather than sculpture and stone is a more modest way to approach the decorations and the illustrations of biblical stories. The founding of medieval towns. So towns are growing in uh, after 1095, after the First Crusade. Um, we are finding these towns established near highways or rivers outside of the walls of the fortified city. Local markets that used to be outside of the castles have been forming over years, and a new class of people are emerging, a middle class, midway between poor serfs and feudal lords. It is said that city air makes a man free. These towns are purchased from wealthy landowners. Charters are being set up that are regulating the town. 
And then guilds are forming, craft guilds are forming, like wool or other crafts, uh, maybe furniture guild, and they are protecting buyers and sellers of the goods, regulating prices, fixing wages, and establishing standards of quality in the production of these goods. Purchase charters are now self-governed and not governed by lords. So we are moving away from the authority of the feudal lord and also moving away from the authority of the church in this case. So guild halls are going to uh, spend money in public art and also um, a new secular world is forming. Medieval universities are also starting. Um, landmark um, contributions of medieval Christendom in the Western society included trial by jury, and the Catholic Church is also um, starting universities. So education in medieval Europe was almost extensively a religious enterprise. But with the rise of towns and the influx of previously unavailable texts, new schools are growing that are known as universities. They're forming in Bologna, in Paris, in Oxford, and they are forming in cities. So the universities are offering a basic liberal arts curriculum divided into two parts, grammar, logic, and rhetoric, and then also arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. There are also programs in professional disciplines, such as medicine, theology, and law. The exams for the bachelor's of arts degrees are usually taken after the completion of a three to five year course. And the MA, the master's of arts, are qualifying students to teach theology, practice law, and medicine. Although usually there is still another four years that are required for a doctoral candidate. That includes a defense of a thesis uh, to a traditional board of professionals. University students are bringing pressures on town to maintain reasonable prices for food and lodging and controlling the salaries of and the teaching schedule of their teachers. In medieval drama, we are seeing plays and pageants often performed in or outside of the church. Vernacular languages are beginning to replace Latin in these so more people understand them. We have things like the mystery play that is dramatizing the aspects of biblical history from the fall of Lucifer to the Last Judgment, the miracle play enacting stories from the life of Christ, the Virgin Mary, or different saints. And the third type of play is the morality play, dealing with the struggle between good and evil. The morality play certainly has precedences um, in, say, devices already encountered in Plato's Republic, St. Augustine's The City of God. Characters in the morality play are personifications of abstract qualities of the human condition. In Dante, in his Divine Comedy, this is probably a, the landmark epic poem in the Middle Ages. This is written by a Florentine poet. Uh, Florence is in Italy. Uh, Dante Alighieri lived from two, uh, uh, 1265 to 1321. And in his comedy, he is recording on a literal level, uh, level the adventure-packed journey through the realm of the dead. On a symbolic level, the poem is describing the, the spiritual pilgrimage of the Christian soul from hell to purification to ultimately salvation. It is the quintessential expression of the medieval mind and gives dramatic form to fundamental precepts in Christian ways of thinking about life and death. The content of the poem provide invaluable pictures of ethical, political, and theological concerns of Dante's own time. In the comedy, Dante is accompanied through hell by the Roman poet Virgil. 
Virgil is standing in for and symbolic of human reason. Dante deeply admired Virgil's great epic, the Aeneid, and was familiar with the hero's journey to the underworld included in the sixth book of the poem. Dante's guide Virgil may only travel so far as to the top of Mount Purgatory for why human reason serves as the pilgrim's initial guide to salvation. It cannot penetrate the divine mysteries of the Christian faith and also Virgil was not a Christian. Remember, he was pagan before Christianity uh, was part of the Roman landscape as the official religion. Dante is escorted by Beatrice, the symbol of divine wisdom, modeled on a Florentine woman who he appears to have stalked throughout his life. He is rejecting the Latin clerics and scholars and writing instead in an Italian language for everyday speech. He called the poem a comedy because the piece begins with the affliction hell and ends in the joy of heaven. Later admirers added the divine part to it. Sacred numerology appears in Dante, like the number three, symbolic of the Trinity, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. The book is divided into Aristotelian divisions of human psyche, reason, will, and love, and they also represent the potential moral conditions in the Christian soul, perversity, repentance, and grace. Repentance and grace, yes. Each of the divisions, the books, have 33 cantos, to which Dante adds an introductory canto to a total sublime 100, and this uh, number symbolizes plenitude and perfection. Each canto in, consists of stanzas that are composed in terza rima, interlocking lines that rhyme A, B, A, B, C, B, C, D, C. There are three guides to escort Dante in the three divisions of hell, purgatory, and purgatory, um, the three main rivers of hell. Three squared, nine, are regions of sinners in hell and the circles of penitence in purgatory and the spheres of heaven. The elaborate numerology of the comedy is matched by multi-leveled symbolism that draws into synthesis theological, scientific, and historical information based on ancient and medieval sources. The inhabitants of Dante's universe are real people drawn from history and legend, and others from his own era, citizens of the bustling urban centers in Italy through which he had wandered around. Dante reinforces the medieval and essentially Augustinian view of the bond between the city of man and the city of God. At the same time, this is a warning that actions in life bring inevitable consequences in the text. In the most lively of the books, we go through these realistic images that he creates in the Inferno. With grim moral logic, he assigns the sinners what their sins mean in hell, where each is, a, is punished according to the nature of their sins. The violent are immersed in boiling blood, gluttons wallow like pigs in their own excrement, but for the sins, as we go from the bottom to the top, what Dante shows us is that accidental sins, sins of passion, like manslaughter, are not as bad as sins that are made um, with uh, intent, um, willful intent. Those are the sins that are going to be most punished. We also in the ninth circle of hell, we get to find out what um, the devil looks like. The devil is described as hideous with three faces, two of them merging from the shoulders, two wings underneath each head that blew three different winds, and then weeping from six eyes, weeping blood, chin, uh, three chins, blood and pus, coming out of the mouth, coming out of the eyes, and every single mouth chewing on a sinner. Ultimately, he will be redeemed 
when Beatrice uh, ultimately will guide him to heaven. Uh, so kind of like in what we discussed in Courtly Love in the last chapter, uh, love again saves the day. We had talked about the Crusades um, and the Byzantines in our, our earlier chapters. Here we see the, the Western Roman Empire, the Eastern uh, Ro Roman Empire known as the Byzantine Empire. And again, this empire has been flourishing, basically the Greek Catholic Church, but the Crusades ultimately are going to lead probably to the end of the Byzantine Empire when they are sacked and ultimately their territory taken by the Turkish Ottoman. This is going to happen when Constantinople is sacked in 1204 and ultimately falls to the Ottomans in 1453. And as I said, this is going to lead and it helped to ignite uh, the Renaissance with refugees fleeing the city and also looking for better ships and new ways to trade with China and with India. This Ottoman Empire is also known as the Turkish Empire, and they are controlling much of Southeast Europe, Western Asia, and Northern Africa between the 14th and the uh, um, uh, early 20th centuries. Ultimately, the Ottoman Empire will really kind of fall uh, after World War I when they're on the losing side, and much of their territories become split up by European powers, and that's where we get modern countries like Iran and Iraq, that their borders don't necessarily make a lot of sense in terms of the history of tribal rivalries between them, and probably also is responsible for maybe much of the unrest as well. The pilgrimage. So the pilgrimage is started when the church is anticipating the return of Jesus in the year 2000, spearheading when it didn't happen. They reconcile uh, the advent of this new age, and there is a revival of church construction accompanied by uh, monastic reform. Within a period of about 150 years, 1,000 monasteries and abbey churches are raised, many that have enshrined relics and that were either found locally or brought back from the Holy Lands, from the Crusades, things like the piece of the cross on which Jesus was crucified, uh, the crown of thorns, again, kind of dubious in terms of if they're real or not. But in the pilgrimage that starts from Santiago um, uh, de Compostela in northwest Spain. We find a line of churches through northern Spain all the way into Paris and Arles and Geneva. And this would be a trip that the faithful are taking. They're taking a spiritual journey, not that different in a way, kind of like what Dante's doing. Well, different and not different but taking a spiritual journey, but also learning what it is to be French or Spanish in the process of doing this. The Romanesque church is a more like a medieval a castle in many ways. We see the barrel vault and the arch that we saw from the Romans. We are building larger uh, stone masonry churches here, um, but they can't build too tall because they, the, they haven't really figured out the engineering of this too much yet. The walls are also instrumental in holding up the roof. And so because of that, we don't have the huge stained glass windows that are gonna accompany the Gothic church. Nearly all of these churches are not the basilica type of rectangle from the Romans, but are in the, uh, the plan of a cross. Generally, you have uh, bays that are formed from the, um, the crossing of the vaults, 
typically you have aisles, you have also a, um, uh, you have a altar in the front, and then generally ambulatories. And the ambulatories run outside of the middle aisle, and often in these ambulatories you will find art and the Stations of the Cross and things like that. The next great style is the Gothic style. So the Gothic style begins um, in the Basilica of Saint-Denis, a large medieval abbey church in the city of Saint-Denis. Uh, the church is completed in 1144 and considered to be the Gothic church. In the 12th century, Abbot Suger uh, rebuilt portions of the church, innovating structural and decorative features. So the large cruciform or cross uh, building has again taken over the basilica, and the major innovations are the rose window, also the three portals or the three entrances, that end, again, the, the number three, the trinity, uh, also purgatory, hell, and heaven represented. And the churches are being made bigger with a new invention called the pointed arch. So the pointed and the ribbed arch is allowing them to build bigger. They are putting the building's weights onto columns. And so because of that, massive full walls of stained glass are allowing colored light to come into uh, the churches. Of these great, great Gothic cathedrals, Chartres is one of the largest ones. Um, it is built over a couple hundred of years. It has a architectural feature of stained glass, a rose window, but also because the building was somewhat flawed and the walls started to bow outwards, they built these flying buttresses to push the walls back upright and to, again, take the force of the ceiling and not have the building explode, but have the building's weight go down to the ground. The stained glass in Chartres is some of the great stained glass in human history. The rose window usually has a centerpiece from the Bible, like the Virgin Mary, surrounded by saints, and then lesser saints or patrons who helped pay for the church around it. The glass allows for colored light and is one of the great art forms that comes from the Middle Ages. The sculpture is, is still very much like the early religious sculpture that we were seeing in post-Constantine Rome. Not much of the body. The body is still kind of considered profane. We are getting a little more weight, maybe a little bit closer to contraposto here in the late Gothic, but in the early Gothic, the saints almost appear to float in space. Generally over one of the main doors, uh, the tympanium, we have uh, relief sculptures. Here we're looking at the tympanium of St. Lazarus, uh, Lazarus who was risen from the dead by Christ. And we are seeing the, the, the souls that are rising and underneath seeing the devils and the damned going into hell. You're always reminded of that in these churches. Notre Dame in Paris, also again, looking very much like Chartres with the flying buttresses, uh, the rose windows, and ultimately what we're seeing are more flamboyant steeples. Uh, very maybe similar to the crown that a king might wear in Paris, let's say. Also, the churches are being decorated with water spouts that are taking water away from the building to minimize damage from rain. And they are building these gargoyles. And these gargoyles uh, uh, are kind of half man, half animal kind of little uh, um, chimeras, hybrid creatures that are protecting the church. 
And this again takes me back to our very first lecture on shamanism and the impossible entities in cave art. We are still seeing this notion of man and animal combined, but now in different ideologies and different theologies. The Italian Gothic, a little bit different than the French Gothic, it is still more based on the geometric purity of the ancient Romans, um, equilateral triangles and perfect square or perfect um, circles, and the, the resolution of the circle and the square. My favorite, though, of the Gothic styles uh, is the rayonette. Uh, in the rayonette, the more flamboyant style in Saint Chapelle, uh, this is built and consecrated in 1248 for King Louis uh, the Ninth, and Louis is housing his passion relics that includes the true crown of thorn and a piece from the cross. When you look at the amount of colored stained glass in the image you have to ask yourself, how is all that glass holding up the ceiling? It's physically impossible for that to happen. And so inside on this upper chapel with the rose window and all the glass, it seems as if the miracle of faith is holding up the ceiling. And I think that that's a remarkable piece of conceptual architecture here. Now on the outside of the building, we can see the real truth that there are a number of columns that are holding up the roof, but from the inside, those columns are somewhat invisible in the stained glass and kind of create a sense of the miraculous. Also, the flamboyant rayonet steeples very much are relating to a flamboyant bejeweled crown of a king. In painting, we are seeing the Gothic altarpiece so these altarpiece that are also kind of like the visual illustrations that you would find in the books, the illuminated manuscripts, we get panels, generally wood panels, that are showing us biblical stories. Here we're looking at Simabue, the Madonna enthroned. Below her are four Hebrew uh, prophets. We are looking at hieratic scale rather than real space. The most important figures are largest, in this case, the Virgin Mary. Notice that the faces of the angels and of the Virgin Mary all very much idealized rather than actual people, whereas the Hebrew saints seem to have a little more individuality on them. Simabue is one of the great painters painting in tempera and then using gold leaf in the Byzantine icon style that we had studied in our chapter on uh, the Abrahamic religions. And then music in the Gothic uh, world and the Gothic cathedral. So musical notation is invented uh, in 900 CE by Benedictine monks at the monastery of Cluny in southern France. Um, they are devising the system that is um, using the seven notes and the scales of A through G. And we are finding staffs of colored lines, yellow for C, F for red, for example, and measuring numas, notational designs that are traditionally written above the words to indicate tonal ascent or descent. And we are falling now into the musical polyphony that I had teased out in the last chapters, where two or more lines of melody are a Western invention that um, are composed early of Gregor Gregorian chants, where the melodies are singing both parts simultaneously and both voices moving note for note in a parallel motion, parallel organum. The second voice begins moving in a contrary motion, and this contrary second part is usually pitched a fourth or a fifth above or below the first, creating a kind of pure hollow sound. Ultimately, in polyphony, we are going to have a principal voice, and that principal voice is there to hold 
the uh, melody, and then there is a fixed kind of voice, and then we have two or more voices that are moving in shorter phrases, usually faster tempos, in addition to one or more independent melodic lines above or below the main melody. So we are seeing a musical technique called counterpoint. And in this polyphony, we are seeing a really like important requiems like Dies Uri, which is a, the day of reckoning. And we are also getting the motet. In the motet, it is a short polyphic, polyphonic choral composition based on a sacred text. So we are now putting music to the text. Let's listen briefly to what a couple of these sound like. So this is what a motet sounds like. So motets are lively, and they're also borrowing uh, music from secular tunes and also becoming more in the vernacular rather than like what we're hearing here, um, or, or uh, in vernacular rather than Latin. And then this is the uh, the the mass for the dead, one of the more the D's iray. Pronounce that right. The D's your I, uh, and again sequence with male voices here. <laughs> the prophet's warning, heaven and earth in ashes burning, doomed to flames of woe unbounded, call me with thy saints surrounded, are some of the lines. Now not mentioned in the textbook, but I think also worth mentioning, is the Tratula. Uh, so the Tratula is a uh, as the conditions of women, the treatments of women, um, and women's cosmetics. So it's covering topics from childbirth to cosmetics, relying on various sources and oral traditions, providing practical instructions. The condition of women and women's cosmetics circulated anonymously until they were combined with the treatments for women sometime in the late 12th century. Cosmics, uh, women's Cosmetics is a treatise that teaches how to conserve and improve women's beauty. It opens with a preface, with a preface later omitted in the ensemble, in which the author refers to himself with a masculine pronoun that is ultimately deleted. Alongside her role as a medical authority, this Tratula, who is the character who is telling us how to do all of this, came to serve a new function starting in the 13th century as a mouthpiece for misogynist views on the nature of women. And again, we are moving more towards women and more towards a kind of feminist way of seeing the world. One last thing happening in music, instrumental music. So medieval music depended on timber, one tone, rather than volume. And medieval stringed instruments include the harp, which would be like a lyre a little bit, um, and plucked, um, bowed fiddles, also pipe organs, bagpipes, and percussion produced, produced by chimes, cymbals, bells, tambourines, and drums. And again, this instrumental music is going to be increasingly put into the church uh, hymns and psalms as well. So for the second part of today's lecture, and let me kind of show you where we're going here.
get back to modules. Show you my talking head again. Hello. So in our chapter, very short chapter you may have noticed when you read it, I have a discussion. Um, this discussion is optional in the summer and will be mandatory in the spring and fall classes. So I wanted to kind of look at what was going on in sub-Saharan Africa around the Middle Ages and begin to introduce the African culture that is happening there while we're studying these other cultures from the Ottomans and also from uh, um, Europe as well. Now we're going to talk about sub-Saharan Africa in chapter 9 when we get to encounter, contact, and the class of cultures. But I wanted to introduce it early here because that chapter has also a lot of other non-Western cultures too. So let's take a look at sub-Saharan Africa. And then there's a discussion over the types of masking ceremonies that I think are really interesting and part of African culture. So we are not looking at northern Africa like Egypt. We are looking at the Africa that is underneath the north, underneath the Saharan Desert, south of the Saharan Desert. And this is a Africa that has not been necessarily um, conquered by Islamic identity. So we have an Africa like Nubia, rich in resources, ebony, ivory, gold, incense, leopard skins that are being traded with the northern uh, African and the Muslim traders who are then trading it abroad. Perhaps one of the more famous of these kingdoms is Nubia between Egypt and Ethiopia. And they conquer Egypt around um, 600 BC, I think. Um, and they are influenced by the pyramids that they see in Egypt and build their own smaller and steeper pyramids. With this part of Africa here that we're studying, um, the eastern side of Africa, which is near India, and then Western Africa. Now, unfortunately, Western Africa, because it's near to Europe, is also going to be involved in that uh, several hundred year slave trade. Now, much of the history of Africa in terms of monumental architecture is a little bit different than what we were studying, maybe from Mesopotamia, the Egyptians, and the Greeks, that there are more perishable uh, housing that is used there, and that perishable housing doesn't have the stone that might remain for thousands of years, but it doesn't mean that it's there, not there. <coughs> Nak culture in northern Nigeria, here in Africa. We see this culture spreading around 1000 BC, vanishing under unknown circumstances around 300 AD in West Africa. It is one of the earliest sub-Saharan producers of life-size terracottas, life-size ceramics. Figures are hollow. Um, some have plant and animal motifs. But the best known are the heads and bodies that do reach life-size proportions. What their function in is largely unknown. It is their stylization and the geometry in their stylization that has really caught the imagination of modern artists like Pablo Picasso when he is making cubism. It is after he has seen a show on African art, and he's influenced by Egyptian motifs and Mayan motifs and African motifs as he comes up with the geometric facets for cubism. Here we're seeing the fragment of one of those life-sized heads, and again, seeing the geometric qualities in the eyes, the geometric qualities in the hair, and something that I think is uniquely African in what it's doing. Benin culture, also in West Africa, um, in the kingdom of Dahomey. Uh, the Dahomey kingdom is known for culture and traditions, young boys apprenticing to older soldiers, and taught the kingdom's military customs until they can join the army. 
almost uh, as famous or as famous are the female soldier co corps called the Ahosi, the king's wives or the Mino, our mothers. And these Dahomeys are also going to be um, uh, the kings of Dahomey sold war captives into transatlantic slavery, and then otherwise they would have been killed in a ceremony known as the annual customs. By about 1750, the king of Dahomey was earning an estimated 250,000 pounds per year selling Africans to European slaveholders. Although the leaders of Dahomey appear initially to resist the slave trade, it does flourish. And what are they getting back? They are getting wealth, they are getting guns, and these guns are allowing them to amass power too. Benin art is influenced. Another one of the things that the Portuguese are bringing to Benin is bronze. And so we see casting of bronze in Benin cultures in a range of objects, um, brass and copper alloy, um, bells, altarpieces, staffs, many, many things that are articulated with birds and snakes and other animals. The Africans are still engaged in animism, that everything is alive and everything has a spirit. We are also looking at this beautiful ivory pendant uh, mask of the Queen Mother uh, from Nigeria made in the 16th century. In Yoruba, also in uh, West Africa, we have a mythology, Oldamari, the supreme god, orders Obatala to create the earth, but on the way, he found palm wine, which he drank and became intoxicated. Therefore, the younger brother and of the latter, Odu Duwa, took the three items of the creation for him, climbed down from the heavens on a chain and threw a handful of earth on the primordial ocean and then put a cockerel on it so it would scatter the earth, thus creating the land on which the Ile Ife would be built. Gods and go kings and gods are often depicted with large heads because the artists believe that the Ase was held in the head, the Ase being the inner power and energy of a person. Also in West Africa, in the Yoruban uh, religion, it's combined of traditional religious and spiritual concepts and practices of the Yoruba people, and the beliefs are part of the Itan, the total complex of songs and histories and stories and ultra, other cultural compacts that make up concepts that make up the Yoruban society. Voodoo guardians of the peace under Yoruba religions have evolved into a robust cosmology. In brief, it holds that human beings possess what is known as the Ayamo, destiny and fate, and are expected to eventually become one in spirit with Oldamare. And notice that this kind of fate that you have destiny and a fate is similar to what we studied in Taoism. And then also the idea that you are going to ultimately be one in the great spirit is similar also to what we find with the Brahman uh, uh, and, all, uh, and the Atman and how it, the Atman or the singular soul is trying to be released from the body and be reunited with the cosmic uh, creativity energy. We are looking at a, uh, a leader, a Yoruban leader, and the kind of crown that they would typically wear, where you have a stylized faces, applied beadwork, uh, typically a bird motif um, that has layers of meanings, especially in terms of uh, the creation myths and landing on the primordial waters, uh, where the first king finally will appear. Here we're looking at Ari Wajoi, the ruler in 1977 of the Oregon Illa State. Uh, we are seeing him with one of those crowns. While he's wearing the crown, you are not to look him in the face. And while he's wearing the crown, he is divine. When the crown is off, it has no particular power. So the interesting thing in 
uh, African, that we would call African art or African sacred religious objects, is that they are sacred during ceremony, not necessarily sacred all the time, like we were seeing with Byzantine icons. Obviously, the influence of Western popular music um, is clearly influenced by African music, and we see that in jazz and rock and roll, amongst other things. The differences between the music we were looking at today if in polyphony in the melodies, what we have in Africa is polyphonic rhythms. So the rhythms have a different rising and falling and pacing than we would find in, um, in Europe. And then also we have griots. And griots are historians and musicians and they memorize the history of the local community and are used in disputes because they are considered to be impartial. So they are, it is not something that you go to college for to learn, it is something that you are born into. You are born into a musical family. Let's look at a little bit of what African music and dance looks like, and then we will hear just a little bit of a griot playing. And again, notice the polyrhythm and how that polyrhythm has a similar quality to the polyphony in melody that we had just heard. Pretty cool stuff. I'm never sure in these videos, because they're posted on YouTube, how much of the music I can play for you without having YouTube block the lecture. So I'm kind of just giving you a taste of things. You, you find, though, in the lecture slides that you have a link to all of this and you can listen to all of it. And then here is a griot playing a stringed instrument and then singing. He's playing a chora. So we have kind of an idea of some of the kinds of uh, musical forms. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in the next, uh, when we get to chapter nine. We find unique architecture in, uh, in Africa as well. Uh, this would be in Jene. Uh, this would be Northern Islamic uh, Africa. And we are looking at the Great Friday Mosque built out of mud. I had mentioned this in our lecture on Islam. Sculpture-wise, some of the greatest sculpture I think that's ever been made in terms of how it's using its materials and the animism in the materials. So from the Dogon people, we find this cylindrical wooden sculpture and they are still revealing the branches in the sculpture in terms of how round they are. We are looking at a seated couple, and also we are looking at a, a dignified figure in Guan or Zhou society that is um, a woman of uh, importance who is helping women who have trouble conceiving, bearing, or rearing children. And she has a kind of crown that she wears that is symbolic of her place in the society. From the lower Congo, we see Nakandi figures. And they begin as a plain wooden carved figure commissioned from a sculptor. And then they are empowered by the owner. And they are packed with materials to linked to the dead and also for punishing enemies. Materials like hunting nets, uh, nails are pounded in, mirrors put into eyes to drive away evil spirits. We can see some of these in Los Angeles on the campus of UCLA at the Fowler Museum. I think they're magnificent. And then masking ceremonies. 
So the masking ceremonies is a, a great African art of spiritual agency, and the masquerade is perhaps the greatest of all the arts, involving sculpture, costume, music, movement. A masquerade does not merely contact spirit powers to affect change. It brings the spirits themselves into the community. Here we're looking at a photograph of Noo, a guiding spirit of the Temni, a women's organization called Bondo, which regulates female affairs. Bondo prepares young girls for initiation into adult status and afterwards presents them to the community as fully mature women. As in many African society, young people deemed ready for initiation are taken from their families, isolated together away from the community, and they learn the secrets of adulthood and go through physical ordeals. This is an ajile. Uh, an ajile is a sculpture from Nigeria that is performed with a dancer. It has all of the people represented in the community as a giant anthill, and the ajili is uh, a, a, a dance and a ritual that brings good luck to the community and has magical powers until it hits the ground or a woman touches it. And you will be watching a video on this later. I have an extra credit assignment for you if you want to do it, based on the art of a contemporary artist living in Chicago named Nick Cave. Nick Cave is teaching um, uh, uh, fiber arts, and he is a performance artist and a dancer and a sculptor, and he is creating costumes that, when worn, make noise and are called sound suits, and they remind me a lot of the African mass ceremonies. So for our discussion, again, optional if you're in the summer and mandatory in the spring or winter, I want you to watch the Ajile, and I also want you to watch this uh, performance here from 2007. We will see... Uh, since it's not going to load very easily, I want you to watch this. And in this performance, we are going to hear the polyrhythms, and we are going to see fibrous costumes. And here we are watching a goat with a mask doing dance steps. And again, the traditions here may go back for thousands of years, the buffalo mask with a bronze uh, a bell. Um, the dance steps probably go back thousands of years. And I think what's interesting is you can see it's in the modern world in terms of the clothing, but then the costume itself and the rhythms and the dance steps probably go back much further. I love this part of this. The music gets a little more intense. The dancing gets a little more intense. So I want you to watch this. And then I want you to think about, are these ceremonies theater, art, music, magic? Uh, are they combinations of all of this? In the two ceremonies, I want you to show me that you have closely watched and monitored the two videos by telling me what sort of costumes, participation, dance, and music you're seeing and then describe kind of what is this, or is this a combination of different art forms? And then I want you to start to think about what performances are similar today. I choose Burning Man. I have a video of Burning Man here. I think there are, I don't think it's exactly the same, but it is a kind of combination of theater, art, magic, and music. Um, I would say certainly when we see Tet, and we see the dragon performances in Tet, there are certain similarities. And then if you want some extra credit, I want you to watch the videos on Nick Cave, and I want you to make a sound suit. Now, you don't have to make a sound suit as elaborate as the ones that you will see from Nick Cave. And you can see some student examples if you want to make this. Like I saw a sound suit made out of balloons, where as the figure was dancing, so there'll be a performer in this video that you'll be sharing, 
and then the performer, as they move in however you make your suit or however you assemble your suit from whatever you have, certain sounds will be made from the movements. And again, as the suit makes movements and sound, it has a quality of living and life and maybe magic to it that it doesn't simply have when it is just sitting there on a mannequin. All right, so that's the lecture for chapter six. We also are looking at sub-Saharan African culture and African art. There's an extra credit assignment here. And our next chapter, we will go into the Renaissance. And I will see you all very soon. Bye-bye.